Adventurers, what wizard? A new badge has been announced. Oh, that's crazy. Aren't we quitting Albion? No, we're not quitting Albion. There's a new patch hat. We need to be excited. It's a patch that talks about the upcoming update in Albion Online. We're talking about the Foundations update. Everything has been revealed. And we're getting a lot of things. Territory changes. The precursor to companions. I'm not even joking. You're gonna see exactly what I mean. There's some awesome balance changes that remove some abilities and add some new abilities. And the crystal weapons. Oh, don't delay it any further. Just jump into it. Let's begin, adventurers. All right, adventurers, I'm gonna be reading the whole whole thing which is gonna be incredibly boring it's not gonna be boring hat just look at it i'll have some timestamps so if you care about different topics like combat balance changes and so on and so forth i will make some timestamps you in your right well yeah first of all let's get into the fortification uh information fortification update if you don't know the fortification update i'm gonna be linking the dev talk and the video about it in the description of this video so fortifications are upgradable walls oh that's amazing we're getting walls we're not just getting walls oh yes we're also getting gates walls gates and gods for territories amazing just wait. To raid or conquer a territory, you will need to fight your way through these fortifications. Fortifications can be built and upgraded with a territory fortification point. Wait, E? Territory fortification point? They're not very good at writing this, are they? Yeah, they kind of messed up over there, but it's fine. When a territory owner changes or at the end of a guild season, all fortifications are reset. That's also a misspelling right there. It is a little bit of a misspelling hat. Okay, but I understand the point. So the idea is that you are going to be able to fortify a territory. You're going to be able to build walls around it. You're going to be able to build different fortifications uh, based on the wallpaper that they've upgraded on the test server, which I'm going to show you in a second. You also have siege uh, engines. I've seen some trebuchets over there, which seems very interesting. I'm not sure if those are just for aesthetic purposes. They are! Or if they're actually going to be added in the game itself. They're not. Why are you so pessimistic? It's Eldian Online we're talking about, Wizard. That's a fair point. Okay. Uh, but what I don't like about this is this line right here. All fortifications are restarted or reset at the end of a guild season. The reason I don't like this is because, as far as I understand it, those fortifications are made to be mighty citadels. Those are not my words. Those are the words of Robin Hinkies whenever he presented the update itself. So, a mighty fortification that lasts for three months at most. Like, I understand the need of those fortifications to reset, but what I was actually hoping uh, when they first announced the fact that they're going to be making player-built castles and so on and so forth a while ago, whenever they first announced those, I was hoping for something like Limhurst entirely built by players. Now, I know something like that is very, very, very hard to do, but simply because of the fact that it's very hard to do for the players and probably for the developers as well, it's something that, in my opinion, would just transcend the barrier of time in Albion because that's what the castle is meant to do like don't get me wrong even in real life we have castles that don't exist anymore we have empires that just crumbled but we still have their remnants how cool it would be if SBI would allow players to essentially build Limhurst again just as an example of the size I'm talking about in the black zone somewhere fully player built fully player run let's say it's uh, a city ran by a certain guild that runs the city in a deep, in a specific way like a tyrant guild in another part of the world as a city uh, that runs based on the democracy and so on and so forth like just creating different player dynamics uh some cities are open for everybody some cities are not uh, like imagine how cool it would be if you would be able to build a city and upon the city being destroyed the remnants of the city would remain over there now for the map to not be covered by remnants because if the remnants persist uh, you know what i mean if, if you can always see let's say a wall or the foundation or stuff like that then you're gonna have the map filled with foundations well no because this is supposed to be something very hard to build the same way legendary weapons whenever they're gonna be added they're gonna be very hard to acquire this should be in my opinion 10 times harder like, there should be at most one castle and the guild should grind for five years to finally build that castle but when it's built it's something that remains and transcends the history of Albion online that's what I was expecting when I heard when I first heard about this now is what I'm expecting doable not by a lazy death team I don't think they're lazy hat I just think they're managing their resources oh yes you're doing the same thing when you're over three thing the idea is that, uh, unfortunately, this doesn't seem to be the update that adds those massive citadels. It's just an extra thing that you can use to customize your territories, which is absolutely nice, but it's not the nicest thing. So, in conclusion, useless update, Darkstar is saying in the chat. Well, I don't think it's a useless update. 
I'm still very excited about everything that's coming, but I just wish this was on a larger scope. And I don't really like the fact that they restart. And also, I don't like the fact that they just happen in the confines of a territory. Now, fortification points, those are essentially the points that you're going to be able to get to buy the fortifications. Uh, again, some parts I'm just going to be glancing over. The full patch is going to be in the description, but since I don't want this video to be way too long, and it already kind of is. Yes, I've noticed the time hat. Thank you. Uh, I'm going to be glancing over some of those things. So you're going to need fortification points, which you're going to be generating by simply just uh, having and holding territories, high level territories or high power level territories. I should say uh, you're going to be generating fortification points and then with those fortification points you're going to be able to build walls and gates which is super interesting and gods now something that's super interesting there's a person that jumped on the test server to see this themselves and look at this the gods can be upgraded in terms of HP auto attack damage and also the spells and the question that I have are those spells going to be customizable because those are spells that we can actually see in the game itself and I also have another question is this the precursor to companions? Because check this out, you spend some points for th that you gain during certain activities, then with those points, as you can see right here, this is the cost right here, I would guess those are the fortification points, you spend those points to buy those um, mobs, let's say, those companions, essentially, I'm gonna be calling them. And then you spend those points to upgrade them from tier four to tier five, from tier five to tier six, from tier six to tier seven, and so on and so forth. This could be the precursor of companions in Albion Online. We're finally getting Morgana nannies. Yeah, Morgana mummies might become followers soon enough, because usually what they've done for group players, they've also somewhat done for solo players. Like, look, for example, the Black Zone. The Black Zone is a group-oriented zone, and we have the Mists, which is a solo-oriented zone. So it wouldn't truly surprise me if at some point they're going to use this system and expand on it to actually give us companions. Oh, waifu simulator. Pretty much waifu simulator, but I'm all up for it, adventurer. I'm all up for it. Of course you are. You're a degenerate. I curse you, heretic. Next, we have some changes when it comes to the prime timer and so on and so forth. Basically, you're going to need to craft a siege banner, and this siege banner makes those fortifications attackable. And there's a lot of very interesting mechanics to do with the siege banners themselves. You can read more about it over here. Siege banners are now required to raid or conquer a territory. These are new items that can be crafted at the toolmaker, and they have their own crafting specialization note on the destiny board itself. Uh, and it's very interesting, a guild can use a siege banner during prime time near an enemy territory. A race banner will slowly weaken the territory force shield over time. The territory force shield is basically what prevents everybody from just willy-nilly attacking your walls. You can only attack the walls if you have a siege banner during the prime time. Until that moment, they are immune. Even during prime time, the walls are immune if you don't have a siege banner. A raised banner can be carried like a power crystal by a guild member and it gives some buffs. This is super interesting. It gives some buffs to the existing players, which you're gonna be able to see uh, this, this right here. It provides a defensive buff to its carrier and an attack speed buff to any allies within its range. If an attack was declared during the previous prime time, a raised banner is upgraded to a conquest banner. And that changes a little bit the dynamic of the whole thing. Again, if you are a guild player, I strongly suggest check this out. It's super interesting stuff and I'm very happy about this. Now, the demolition hammer has also been renamed to siege hammers and it can be used to attack the walls and the gates. You cannot attack the walls with your spells you need to use a siege hammer or uh, the previous demolition hammer essentially and the interesting part is that allies can use the same siege hammer to repair the walls and gates and this is something that i'm very curious about this system seems very inspired by the world versus world versus world system in guild wars 2 huh, Albion online copying from other games who would have thought copying is great hat oh yes i know you do it all the time Copying is great. I'm all up for the idea of games taking the best systems from each other. And if they truly took this system from Guild Wars 2, it's going to be amazing. Because in Guild Wars, the way this works, you can, let's say you have a castle. You are the defenders of the castle and somebody's attacking it. If you have, let's say, an endless supply of wood, you can just constantly repair the gate, constantly repair uh, the, the walls and so on and so forth. So if you technically invest a lot of resources into this, you can simply just keep your castle going, which might seem tedious, but it's actually incredibly fun because that's how siege works. You don't besiege a castle in an hour. You stay there for a week, for a month, for a few days. Again, I'm talking about real life. In the past, it took even a couple of years to besiege a mighty citadel. Now, of course, you don't want to wait for a year to besiege a castle in Albion Online. But I'm just saying, I like the fact 
that I mean again we don't know yet but it seems to be inspired by Guild Wars 2 which means that you're going to be encouraged to basically use a lot of resources so the stone price will actually go up quite a lot because you need it to defend I'm expecting the wood price to go up by quite a lot maybe even the um, uh, ore price because you might need metal to enforce the gate and so on and so forth and this makes gathering very much worth it once more now again gathering for the most part is worth it right now except stone gathering which this clearly fixes but I hope it's not just going to be the stone price that goes up thanks to this i hope it's gonna be everything else well your hope is wrong wizard i think my hope is wrong but i guess we're gonna see then we have some information about fortified gates this is super interesting basically there's two things that have to be destroyed when it comes to the gates there's a crystal and the gate itself the first thing that the enemies will be able to destroy is the crystal and the second thing is the gate now what's the crystal the crystal is basically something that allows players from inside of the gate to teleport out now basically because of the fact that guilds can essentially destroy the crystal first it forces the allies to make a very tough decision like okay do we stay on the walls and attack that's somewhat of an advantage because we have the higher ground but limited advantage like enemies can simply just go out and heal if we damage them too much or do we open the gate so that we can properly fight the enemy but if we lose they just go in it's a very 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 interesting dynamic that's um, at some point gonna force the players to make a tough decision which i very much like secondly we have the territory activity chest which also we can see in this sneak peek right here again unfortunately i cannot show this myself because i'm not in a guild that owns a territory or in any guild for that matter but essentially this is a chest uh the chest that they've been talking about in the latest dev talk basically every single territory will now hold a chest and let's actually read the patch because it explains it better than i could to reward guilds that are active in the regions they control via territories and at the same time to offer an additional incentive to raid those territories we have introduced a territory activity chest these replace the old crystal league battle vaults when a player receives loot from killing mobs opening a loot chest gathering or fishing there's a small chance that this will add additional loot to a cache we're talking about that cache right here the territory activity chest the amount of loot generated through this activity activities depends on the territory's power level. Activity in non-instance neighboring regions will also add loot to the cache at 25% of this rate. So uh, if you're adding, let's say, at 100% in the uh, actual zone of the territory, well, if you go in a neighboring region, you're only going to get 25% of that, which is still good. And something very interesting, non-instanced neighboring regions. So from what I'm reading, like from what I'm understanding, if I'm uh, understanding this correctly, if you do a solo dungeon in the region of a territory that you own, or, you know, simply in a region of a territory, you're gonna generate um, extra loot for the owners of that territory. But if you go and do a solo dungeon in a neighboring region, then there's a little bit of a problem because you cannot do instance content. So you have to do open world content from what I'm understanding, if I'm understanding this right. Uh, that's the first thing that I noticed that's kind of weird. And the second thing that I noticed is this right here, a small chance. There is a small chance that they will add additional loot. I don't think this should be a small chance. I think this should be a guarantee chance. However, even though I got scared about this when I read it for the first time, reading it further will just uh, make it a little bit clearer. Roads of Avalon are excluded from this. They truly hate the roads. Yeah, I don't know why they've excluded them. Because this would have been the perfect reason for guild leaders and players to just go and play in the roads. But I guess SBI really wants to kill this type of content, so I don't really understand why. I think you're wrong, wizard. How am I wrong? They don't just want to kill this type of content. They want to kill the whole game. Yeah, that's a fair point, actually. This cache is inaccessible to players. After 24 hours at the start of prime time, the cache's most valuable loot will be moved into the territory activity chest. During the prime time, the owning guild cannot open the chest, but other guilds can raid the territory, break the chest's protection, and steal these items. Raiding, however, will destroy 30% of those items randomly. After the prime time, any guild member can check the chest content, but only members with the guild right activity chest access are allowed to take loot from the chest and so on and so forth. Now, the super interesting part about this is this. The current accumulated estimated value, as well as the average estimated value, can be viewed in the territory information on the map this is the first chest ever in the whole game that shows you the value before you open it that's incredible and i hope they use this for more uh systems in the game i genuinely hope they don't just use it for this type of content and that's it i hope they develop it slowly but surely because unfortunately adventurers albion online being a full loot mmorpg does not have the main appeal of mmos fun no, it is fun, Hat. But the problem is that Albion Online does not really offer you that 
progression feeling like okay yes you are progressing you are getting from let's say zero spec to 100 spec maybe to 120 spec that's progress but the gear progress is not really there because look as a super experienced player you don't really want to run around with the most expensive gear with 8.4 masterpiece items when you go in the black zone there are some times and some places in which you want to do that but for the most part you're staying in the mid tiers maybe even low tiers sometimes so the fact that albion doesn't have that it means that the average mmorpg player feels lost and maybe you went through that maybe some of your friends went through that and that's the moment in which you should have quit no, that's the moment in which, unfortunately, the game should offer you some guidance. The game should just point you in the right direction. Because this game is not about gear. But you have to understand it's one of the only MMORPGs that's not about gear. Now, another thing that MMORPGs have is the feeling of being rewarded. Which usually happens through gear. In Albion, it happens through silver, through kills, through stuff like that. The fact that you can know exactly what you're going to be getting before you get it, or for the most part, it's actually a very good incentive. Imagine this. If you were to see a solo dungeon in the open world and by hovering with your mouse over the solo dungeon, you would be able to see, hey, you will make approximately 500k from the solo dungeon. At that moment, you might be more interested to do some solo dungeons because you understand, hey, wait, this solo dungeon that may be upgraded over time, it's actually going to be worth it. And so you go into the solo dungeon. If let's say, like, if this system would be implemented across the whole game, it would give the players a more, in, uh, more of an incentive to actually go into the content. Because let's say you're a new player and you stay in the yellow zone. And in the yellow zone, you find only solo dungeons that are approximately going to be giving you 50k. And then at some point, you decide to go in a tier 8 zone. And in a tier 8 zone, you find the same solo dungeons, but this time they offer you 500k. And at that moment, you realize, huh, maybe I should actually go in the black zone. Huh. Wait a second, you know, it just clicks on you because you understand the risk versus reward. But unfortunately, that's just not how the game works right now. You can go in a tier 4 zone, let's say a yellow zone mist and get 2 million silver per hour. And if you go in the roads of Avalon for 2 hours or for 1 hour, you're going to get 500k if you don't get ganked. So I'm just trying to say that unfortunately, the risk versus reward uh, balance right now in the game is very much messed up. And a system like this could actually somewhat fix it, adding some limits on certain chests and also letting players know what they're going to be getting approximately before they actually get it. Now, how are they supposed to actually implement this? If this is actually doable or not, I have no idea. But I just know that the way you drive MMO players forward is by offering them rewards. And try your luck is not the best reward right now. That's the thing. Another interesting thing is this line right here. All territories in the Outlands receive one of five new layouts. That's super interesting. And I'm very curious to see how much customization you actually have uh, in those layouts. I hope, I hope it's more than they've been doing so far. I just hope that. Then we have some changes coming to season names. All of the seasons on all of the servers are going to be named season 23. And from now onward, they're going to have the same exact name. Like there's not going to be season 3 on the E server, season 1 on EU, season 24 on West. It's going to be just season 23, regardless on the server you're playing on. There's some changes coming to prime timers, which again, if you want to check them out, I will leave a link for this in the description down below. Uh, there's some changes regarding world bosses, which is super interesting. On Albion East, world bosses now spawn every even numbered hour. Talking about UTC time to avoid colliding with Mentoras. It's kind of weird that this happened. It's not weird that all wizards, it's SDI you're talking about. Yeah, that's true. Season winner statues again. There's some interesting things over here. And this is something that I'm super interested about. The spectator mode. Adventurers, long story short, just so that we don't have to read through all of this. The spectator mode is going to be single-handedly my favorite content to do in the game. We're going to be organizing tournaments with premium prizes or maybe even some crazier prizes in the game itself. Uh, that's going to allow you guys to form some teams, whatever teams you want. Give your team a name and compete in... 5v5s, 10v10s, however many people want to participate in this, we're going to be adjusting the tournament, and I'm basically going to be able to be a spectator of that. Now, if you don't know what a spectator is, well, think of a spectator in an FPS game. I can basically watch anybody's perspective, and I can move around the map freely without actually being in the game itself. Like, I don't show up in the game for you, I just have access to a free roaming camera, which is amazing. 
And I actually hope they give us as content creators the option to do this, at least on the test server. That would be so good for thumbnails and stuff like that. I know it's kind of broken to have free camera and stuff, but I really wish that would be the case. Regardless, I like the fact that we're getting spectator mode. It's not going to be the biggest thing for the average player, but for the content creator, it's going to be amazing, which is also going to mean fun for the average player because we are going to be organizing tournaments like crazy. Next in line, we have some crystal weapon changes. Adventures, we're getting three new crystal weapons that I can actually show you directly in the game itself. I told you this is going to be a long video. The first weapon that we're getting is this right here. Now, adventurers, we already knew this. We've done a video a while ago showcasing this video right here, basically which showcases the new weapons and you can see the icon is not the right one but the description of the spell is basically exactly what we've expected with a pretty big difference however and that's what I want to show you right now you can freely move while channeling. Now, I'm not sure if really move means at the normal speed or it's going to be a little bit of a debuff. For now, it doesn't specify. For now, you can move at the full speed, it seems, while channeling that crazy ability with insane mobility that you already have from Frost Staffs. Dealing a tier 4, 185 magical damage on impact every 0.4 seconds. This is insane. <laughs> this is just insane. The other weapon that we know about is a quarter staff, which I'm going to be showing right here. And again, it's the quarter staff that we've seen. I'll show you the video about this. This, this right here. So we know exactly how this is going to look like. This seems to be the, um, the weapon itself. But we also have a new weapon that we know nothing about. Just look at this. Boom. Gorgeous. And again, the spell description actually fits. By the way, I love the music on this video. I'm going to link it again if you want to see it. But it has the stupidest music ever. I love it. All right. And last but not least, this is a weapon that we didn't know would be coming. An axe. Just look at this. We have no idea how this looks like. We don't have the uh, showcase of this. But it basically tells us that you're going to be dashing in a targeted direction, conjuring an area in a 15 meter radius around you after dashing that lasts for 13 seconds. While inside the area, you can cast Relentless Reap multiple times by recasting the ability. So you can spam your ability like crazy. Dash into the targeted direction, dealing 338 physical damage to all enemies you pass through. By the way, by the way, this is tier 4. Hitting at least one enemy will reduce the cooldown of your weapon abilities, all of your abilities, by 33%. And the cooldown of this is 2 seconds 71. 2 seconds 71. It's wild. You're only going to be limited by energy if you don't use something like Royal Call. Ah, it's another drunken deal, I see. You see very well, Hat. You see very well. Adventurers, an extra little note over here. I'm recording this after recording the original video because a legend in our chat, it's Ovi, sent me this picture right here from the test server. Adventurers, apparently they've accidentally added the knuckles the crystal knuckles the crystal gloves which are going to be having this ability right here enhance your auto attacks for six seconds each auto attack causes a cone to explode out of your target dealing an additional 459 damage why not 69 that would have been great but it is what it is then we have this right here fragment storm oh man uh what weapon is this okay it's a it's a mace Huh, super interesting. Look at the queue. That's a mace. Combine up to three abilities. The combo resets after four seconds. <laughs> wow. Fragmented swing. Uh, 400 something physical damage to enemies. If you hit at least one enemy, you gain one stack of fragmenting storm. And then... Uh... Okay, so where's fragmenting storm? Oh, it's right over there. Okay. Then fragmenting swing. You deal that much physical damage to enemies. And if you hit at least one enemy, you get one stack of fragmenting storm. So it's all building up to this and so on and so forth. Uh, then you have this which deals more damage. Uh, 500 something physical damage in a 4 meter radius. Casting this ability always grants you one stack of fragmenting storm. Like, regardless if you hit the enemy or not. And then you have fragmenting storm itself. The ability that everything was building up towards. An aura that deals magic damage every one second dependent on your amount of fragmenting storm stacks. And it deals basically up to 85 damage per second on top of the damage you've already dealt. And look at the cooldown. I mean, again, this it's still... Uh I mean, again, it's still something uh, up to change, hopefully, because otherwise it's just insane. You can just spam this like crazy. But yeah, that's wild. Uh, then we have Fire Hydra. Oh, this, we've seen it already in the video that I showed you a little bit earlier that I'm going to be linking in the chat as well. We've seen it here, I think it was. 
I think it's the same exact ability. Super cool ability. Let me see. Is it called the same? Come on, I need to see it. Ah, it doesn't show. It doesn't show. But you can see the ability right over here. So we already know how this is going to look like. Super interesting stuff. Super interesting stuff. Uh, where was it? This code. You can see how much damage it deals. And it's quite insane. And it passes through enemies. That's super important. And then we have evasive shot. This is a bow. Jump into the air. And after a short delay, shoot at enemies in a cone on the ground. Dealing 581 magical damage. While in the air, you are invulnerable. And leap backwards 5 meters. So anti-reflect kiter. This is insane. This is insane. And I need to mention something. This is not going to be coming in the next patch. This is just a little bit of a leak that we have right here, which is great. And I wanted to talk with you guys about this. So I have everything included in just one video. Didn't you want to milk this wizard? Well, I wanted to milk this, but I, you know, it's fine. Let's just make a longer video, including everything. So, uh, yes, thank you so much, Ovi, for sharing this with me. You are a legend. You are a legend. Now, back to the original video. We have some tracking changes that are pretty interesting, but not that crazy. The most notable part over here is the fact that right now, if you are tracking an enemy and you don't get there in a specified time, the enemy doesn't just, you don't just lose the hunt, but the enemy runs away. This is basically to prevent the common tactic that SBI has observed. Uh, it's basically a group besieging a target position to get to the hunter. So there was previously no way to deal with the situation besides aborting the hunt and starting a new one. As a result, targets that have been engaged at least once will now escape after some time even when not in combat and move to a new position only known to the hunter this is very 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 good there's some additional changes that again you can check out over here there's some spell icon changes basically daggers are right now even more confusing <laughs> they're still the same color like i don't know why they've done that they changed this i don't think anybody confused this ability with anything they change this, they change this, but those abilities are still problematic because I can never make the difference between them, unfortunately, and so on and so forth. But the interesting part, Adventurers, and in so far, it was pretty interesting as well. It was pretty interesting as well, but now we're getting to the real interesting part. The combat balance changes. Hammers. Remove the ability Bash Knee. The Bash Knee ability has been removed, and they've added a new ability called Power Slam. You dash in a... I, I guess I can just show you how this looks like. I'll buy a hammer real quick. This is the test server, by the way. So we need to check out the ability Power Slam. Okay. First Power Slam. Okay, there's a little bit of an error. They did not change the names of this, so we actually have to read the ability. Dash two meters in the target direction. Okay, which ability makes you dash? I guess this. Then swing your hammer in a cone in front of you. Yes, I don't play hammers that much, so I'm not very familiar with the... Is that it? I think that's it. Yes, that's it. That's it. That's a new ability. Okay. Uh, knocking all mobs in a 3 meter direction. Swing your hammer, dealing 94 physical damage to all enemies hit. If the enemy hit is affected by any crowd control effect, deal an additional 48 magical damage. Pretty good. I don't know why, but I was expecting 2 meters to mean more than just this. I don't know how I feel about the 2 meters dash. It doesn't feel like anything. It feels more like a glitch. It looks kind of weird. They need to work on the animation a little bit. Maybe make it a jump or something like that. Okay. They also removed the ability Heavy Smash. Oh, but I wanted to Heavy Smash. You're another. Shut up, Ed. I did a new ability, Seismic Tremor from All Hammers. And this one, I checked it out a little bit and it's really good. Check this out. Just look at this. Doesn't seem to dash. Yeah, this one doesn't seem like you're dashing. It kind of looks weird. It's bad. It's badass, and the cooldown is very short, and just look at the damage. The first hit, 222. The second hit, 222. And the fourth hit, double the damage, 444. Just look at this. Boom! I love this. I love this. It's great, and I love uh, when they're doing stuff like this. We have some changes to axes. The Carrion Caller, the, the Carrion Scholar E, Morgana Raven, has been heavily buffed. Uh, the healing debuff has been increased from 30% to 40%, the cooldown has been reduced by 3 seconds, and you're gonna be able to deal the damage, the bleed damage, faster. You don't do more damage as it seems over here because the bleed ticks have been reduced, but you just do it much, much, much faster. So it's harder to dodge, and it's harder to defend against. We also have some changes coming to Icicle Staff, the stand time has been reduced, making the weapon feel a little bit more mobile, which is a good thing overall. The defensive slam from all maces, uh, well, the max allies a 
affected by the effect of this ability has been increased from 5 to 10. Now, if you don't know what the defensive slam does, let me see if I can actually find it because, again, I don't play hammers. Oh, wait, mace, 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 mace. My bad, my bad. I don't play maces adventures. I'm sorry. You ain't Kokos Nilch. Yeah, pretty much. All right, so defensive slam. Which one is it? I have no idea which one is it. This? Oh, yeah, this. Oh, you really don't train maces. Yeah, I don't play maces. Attack the target enemy dealing 190 physical damage, and it increases damage resistances by a certain uh, amount, and crowd control resistance for you and up to 10 allies. This is amazing. Uh, now, again, when you're playing with allies with a mace, you're not really... You're more the catch of the team. You just want to catch the enemies. But I guess this is going to be very useful in the arena, for example. And also in ZVZs. God room from all maces. The resistance factor has been uh, modified ever so slightly. It's not going to feel like anything. The rejuvenating flower, the third Q of all nature staffs. The cooldown has been reduced by 0.5 seconds. We have some changes coming to Harpoon. The projectile speed has finally been increased so that people will not be able to outrun it with an F. Thank you, SBI. It took long enough. It did take long enough, but it's here and I'm happy about that. We have some changes coming to Fire Breath from the Mage Cow. The cooldown has been reduced by 10 seconds. The damage per take, however, was reduced. Yeah, I don't know why they want to kill this helmet. The whole game, Wizard, it's not just this helmet. Yeah, it might be like that. Growing Rage from the Royal Hood. The damage increases per stack from 4% to 5%. Again, nothing too interesting over here. Okay, the Avalonian Beam from the Cowl of Purity. Adventurers, read this for a second. Half the damage. Half the damage. But they've added a dot effect that stacks up to one time. And it takes two times. So you can only apply this dot once and it takes up to two times starting one second after the impact. And the damage per tick is 40. So you're going to deal 80 upfront damage, but then the enemy can defend against this. If they don't defend against this, then they're going to be taking another 80 damage. So overall, you're going to be doing the same exact damage to the enemy that doesn't defend, but right now it's finally defendable, which is amazing. I love this. Uh, and I love this type of nerf, because ultimately, it's not really a nerf. Like, if you use it properly and you wither down the defensives of the enemy and so on and so forth, yeah, you're going to be doing the same exact damage. But if you actually just use it willy-nilly, this is a big nerf for you. If you know exactly when to use it, nothing is going to change. But if you're using it improperly, yeah, this is going to be a huge nerf. Uh, and the armor of valor, the channel, has been increased from 2 seconds to 3 seconds. Could this make it back into the corrupted dungeon scene? I hope not. I hated that. Oh man, I really hope not. The ability from Face Sandals, the ethereal form, the transformation delay has been increased by 2 seconds, so you're activating the ability and after 2 seconds you get transformed. The movement speed, however, has been doubled and the stack movement speed has been reduced a little bit. Basically, the more enemies you pass through, the more movement speed you can get. But because they've increased the base movement speed, you're overall getting a little bit less of a buff whenever you're passing through enemies. Alter image from Mistwalker Shoes, the cooldown has been reduced by 5 seconds and then we have some diminishing return changes and some fixes nothing too interesting uh, over here so my dearest adventurers that has been the patch i hope you guys have enjoyed it i'm sorry for the longer video but there was a lot that we could have talked about when it came to this patch so i wanted to cover the whole thing uh it's a very long patch very 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 lengthy patch which by the way you can all test on the test server so by simply going on the test server you have access to all of those changes if you are in a guild you can check the territory changes um yeah Sim simple as that. So I'm very curious to see what you guys think about this patch. Let me know in the comment section down below. Ah, that rhymed! Unintentionally had. Thank you so much for watching this video. And by the way, if you want to know what other news are happening in the Albion Online scene, why don't you check out this video right here? This is a new show that we're trying to do called The Townsfolk Show. A daily show in which we're showcasing different things, drama, clips, and so on and so forth that's happening around Albion Online. Thank you so much for watching. Until next time, safe travels.